Hey there, movie fans. Back for season four of FYC because you demanded it. So the name is shorter, but the game is the same, and so are the players joining me, as always, because what would FYC be without my esteemed colleagues and partners and peers and great friends? Welcome back for season four of FYC 2, the amazing Perry Nemiroff and the mighty Jeff Snyder. Guys, I've missed you so. How yes. excited are you to get into yes. it? Big smiles, as always. It will never change. I freaking love doing this show with you guys. Yeah, I um, missed you guys. I'm just excited to talk to somebody about awards movies. Well, well, we are really going to get into it, and we are going big with this first episode of FYC because we are going to do our picks for Best Picture and Best Director for the nominations at the Academy Awards. And we we have a little bit of a, a hint at maybe where things might go because we had a couple of, uh, of groups pick their nominations, the Critics' Choice and the Golden Globes. But we're going to pick ours. And Perry, I want to start with you. What is your number one pick that is absolutely positively going to get nominated for Best Picture? This one feels very easy to me. Okay. I will say, putting together this year's best picture list, I, I don't like saying this, but you know how every year we have that conversation where it's like, this this year, this year not wasn't as great, but just like isn't as exciting. There's something about this list where I'm like, this is a whole bunch of good movies, but very few are like really getting the fire lit in me where I feel the need to root for them all the way. And those ones that I do feel the need to root for, I think are not going to get in and it breaks my heart. But I will say that I think The Power of the Dog undoubtedly will get a Best Picture nomination. I think it is a great movie and it deserves the nomination. Okay, I'm with you on that. I actually have Power of the Dog number six on my list. But considering that, uh, you know, we are looking at at least eight, maybe up to 10 nominations for Best Picture, uh, Power of the Dog, absolutely. It was nominated for seven Golden Globes, including Best Picture Drama, nominated for 10 Critics' Choice Awards, including Best Picture. Jeff, where does Power of the Dog land on your list for Best Picture? I mean, I have it at number one because I think it's definitely going to be nominated, but I don't think it's going to win, unlike most pundits. I think that Perry was onto something. Uh, she was being generous, too. This year's awards crop is not very good. It's <laughs> really not very good. Um, at least when I, I look at the top contenders, you know, I'm just like, really? These are the movies we're talking about? So I guess I will use my answer on King Richard. I think that King Richard is going to get a Best Picture nomination. I think Will Smith and Anjanou Ellis did a great job. Um, and that one's just going to be hard to deny. Okay, King Richard is number four on my list. Nominated for six Critics' Choice Awards. It's number two on yours, Perry? Yeah. All right, yeah, I mean, I love King Richard. Uh, uh, box office for that movie, so this is what's interesting. But actually, I just want to say, you know, on, on, you know, going on what you were just talking about, as far as the contenders for best picture i agree with you that that these movies are not lighting my fire but i think they're very very good movies perry there's only one movie on my list of predictions for best picture nominations that did light my fire and has lit my fire all year long and i'll get to that in a second but king richard made 14.5 million at the domestic box office since its release on November 18th. So my question for you, Perry, starting with you is, will box office with a whole lot of the movies that are going to be on this list matter when it comes to nominations or even a win? I think it always matters a little because I think success at the box office colors the opinion of how successful and beloved a movie is. So it's like when I think about something like West Side Story, its chances would have been better had the box office been bigger. Yeah. But when I look at almost every single movie on my list right now, none of them are box office juggernauts. So I don't think it's going to impact things that much. And when it comes to King Richard in particular, especially in comparison to a movie like The Power of the Dog, I just think that the likability of King Richard is going to give it a boost the further into the season we get. Whereas, you know, 
something like like Power of the Dog, Belfast. I, I think some of those things, maybe even licorice pizza, maybe some of those things are going to fizzle a little, whereas, you know, King Richard feels like more of a studio crowd pleaser. Uh, it absolutely is a studio crowd pleaser. Jeff, what is, what's your take on how, especially this year, which, uh, you know, clearly – uh, box office took a big hit because, you know, we are still in the middle of a global pandemic. So so you can't judge this year on box office like you judge other years. And you also can't judge this year on box office because the only movies that are really crushing it at the box office are the big superhero movies. But do you think that the 14.5 million domestic gross so far anyway for King Richard will hurt its chances for a nomination or even maybe a win? No, I think that box office is completely irrelevant to this conversation, uh, yeah. particularly this year. Like Perry said, there are no nominees that even have box office except for Dune, really. That's the only movie that opened. I mean, Power of the Dog, Belfast, Licorice Pizza, Coda, t you know, and, and then all these Netflix movies, Tick, Tick, Boom, Lost Daughter, Don't Look Up. Not, these are not box office. They're not even meant to make money at the box office. Um, yeah. Nightmare, Nightmare Alley will be interesting to see how that performs. But I don't, again, that's a movie made for adults. It's a dark noir. It's not the sort of thing that teenagers who are the, seem to be the only people going to the movies these days show up for. So I just don't think that box office matters. I think that people in the industry, actual voters, are savvy and smart enough to recognize that. Uh, just, I, 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 can I add one thing to the box office conversation? Yeah. So. I, I do think box office matters. Like it matters a little bit, like everything matters a little bit. But in this particular year, I feel like certain movies not doing well at the box office could wind up helping something that got a streaming release like Coda. Like I feel like that kind of, you know, yeah. plowed the way for Coda to take up a little more space with space with its really strong streaming word of mouth. Yeah. And listen, uh, as far as like box office, you know, there's only one movie on my list. Uh, that really did well at the box office, and you mentioned it, Jeff. It's it's Dune, which made uh, three hundred ninety million dollars worldwide. But the in general, the, the 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 extreme between the movies that did well and the movies that didn't do well are, I mean, look, the superhero movies like you know Shang Chi. I mean, even Eternals did okay. Of course, Spider Man is gonna Spider Man is gonna have the biggest opening of the year of uh, the pandemic era. But again, you know, you can't can't uh judge the performance of west side story and and king richard king richard which is also on hbo max by the box office because again we are in a pandemic and those movies particularly west side story and king richard and even belfast which made about six and a half million total so far are generally seen by older moviegoers older moviegoers who are more risk averse and and cautious about going back to the theaters whereas younger moviegoers are are will sort of take a chance on a on a spider-man and something like that but i love king richard perry i agree with you it's a big shiny polished studio movie will smith and Anjan U. ellis are fantastic ronaldo marcus green did a great job directing this movie it's inspiring it's a feel-good crowd pleaser it's it's exactly the kind of big studio drama that the, the Academy does love. So that's absolutely on my list. It's at number four. Perry, you have it at number two. Jeff, where is King Richard on your list again? Uh, I had it at six, actually. Okay, okay. All right, now, so I have a question just you know, before we let go of the box office stuff. Do you think that one of those blockbusters, whether it's a Marvel movie like Shang-Chi or Eternals or even No Time to Die, do you, or, or even Spider-Man, uh, do you think that one of those movies could sneak into the best picture field? I, oh, sh mm -hmm. Perry, you're shaking your head. Yeah. No, I'm shaking my head. Yes, but why do you say no, Perry? I feel like I can understand it or make a case for it in certain years where it like stirred the public in, in a unique or exceptional way. And I guess one could say that about Spider-Man No Way Home. It is not an, I loved the movie, by the way. It's not an Oscar contender. And I don't think even the strongest box office, the most excitement for that movie is going to push it in there. And, you know, when it comes to, I don't know, other ones that come to mind, like like Black Widow, Shang-Chi, Eternals, I don't think that they had the fanfare to give them the boost either. If I were to pick one, if we're talking about superhero movies, if I were to pick one movie from this year to put in that best uh, picture nomination field, it would be the Suicide Squad, and it's not happening. Uh, well, well, okay, that's a that's an interesting choice, Perry and Jeff. That's actually a really, really great question because I think that if 
there is a sort of superhero type movie that may enter, uh, you know, the best picture race, it would be Shang-Chi. And yeah. the reason I say that is because, I mean, it did insanely well at the box office. It made like 90 million over the four day opening weekend back in September. But the reason that I'm saying Shang-Chi is because it, it's, it's much like Black Panther, which was nominated for best picture to the extent that the movie is a, is a breakthrough for representation in this case, Asian representation in, in a blockbuster superhero movie. And everybody loved the film. It was more than 90% of Rotten Tomatoes. I loved it. It's actually my fifth favorite movie of the year. <laughs> uh, but I don't think it's going to get in. But I think if any of those movies actually do, it would be Shang-Chi. Okay. All right. Perry, back to you. What else is on your list? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just going to elongate that conversation very briefly. But looking at this list of movies, you know how every single year we have the conversation of like, no one's going to watch the Oscar. Just nobody knows these movies. <laughs> <laughs> Most of these movies are going to run into that problem or a oh, yeah. pretty significant amount of the field this year. Yes. Um, where am I at? Number three? Yes. You said my number three. I gave number three to Dune. Oh, you get, okay. Number three was, okay. So, so why is Dune your number three? I think Dune is another one. So I always think about the trends every year where something comes out super hot at the beginning of the season for, for us right now in particular is Power of the Dog and Belfast. I imagine those fizzling out and sometimes we get some late season entries that, that really pick up steam and use that release date to their advantage. But then I think we have things like, like King Richard and Dune that came out in November and they're just going to be seen by more and more people, especially with streaming access. And I think those are two movies that are just going to keep rising and rising and rising. And also when I look at all of the other categories for Oscar nominations, Dune is popping up quite a bit. And I do think that the hype in individual categories is just going to like feed off of each other and give it a big boost overall. Yeah. The, the crafts are definitely going to power Dune through the season. Um, yeah. I was not a fan of Dune at all, but even I can recognize that the crafts and artisanship, you know, of, of that film is beautiful. So I, I do think that that is a strong contender. So, so personal feelings about the film aside, do you still have Dune on your list because you're acknowledging, hey, yeah, I didn't really dig it, but it is an Oscar contender. And yeah, I, I, I definitely think it's going to be nominated for Best Picture. I have it at number two, honestly. Wow. <laughs> I, I have Dune at number five. Like I said, it was nominated for 10 Critics' Choice nominations. Worldwide box office, $390 million. Uh, I think in its favor for a nomination is the fact that it is a, a grand epic film that – there have been so many attempts to make this movie in more recent years. And Denis Villeneuve, who is an Academy Award nominee for directing Arrival, just really knocked it out of the park, especially after directing Blade Runner 2049, which was also a terrific film. But the, 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 you know, and the 1984 movie has a cult following. I like the 1984 movie for, for nostalgic reasons because I saw it when I was a kid. But I think that the uh, the, the new version is just absolutely fantastic. Uh, and it's uh, the detriment to the film is that it very much feels like half of a movie because it ends so abruptly. And while I think it's it's a lot for a nomination – especially also for best director. We'll get into that and all the crafts, you know, cinematography, production design, hair, makeup, wardrobe, craft services, you know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> but uh, I do think that it'll, it'll be like uh, uh, the fellowship of the ring where it'll get a bunch of nominations, including best picture, but it probably won't, it, it, it's not going to win. Um, now, however, the sequel does, if it tops the original, then it will be like return of the King where it could really be a contender, but we're getting way ahead of ourselves here. All right, Jeff, what else is on your list? I uh, got to put West Side Story on there. Yep. I have West Side Story at three. It's another movie that I thought was just okay, mainly because I didn't believe the the romance between Ansel and Rachel Zegler like at all. But uh, I think it's a beautiful film, uh, a worthy remake, um, and it has some fantastic per performances. And uh, yeah, I just think that this year that that will be enough to get in. All right, Perry, where is West Side Story on your list? Five. Number five. It okay. would have been – see, this is an example of a movie that would have been higher on my list if it had opened bigger at the box office because mm -hmm. it got all that support after its first screenings. And I mean like really enthusiastic responses. 
And I thought that that was going to translate to big box office numbers when it didn't. You know, I'm talking about moving it from spot three or four down to five. I still think it's got a very, very good chance and, you know, really is likely a guarantee at this spot on my list. Yeah, I have West Side Story at number two on my list. West Side Story was nominated for ten, for 11, 11 Critics' Choice nominations, including Best Picture. Of course, we all know the original film 60 years ago went on to win 10 Academy Awards, including Best Picture. That would certainly be a hell of a thing if the remake actually won Best Picture, which it could. Uh, the opening weekend for this film... Of course, everybody was really pouncing on this was $10.5 million domestically. So what we need to see is how the movie does in its second weekend. But what I think is going to happen with West Side Story in its second weekend is because Spider-Man opens this weekend. I think that people, older moviegoers who would go see West Side Story are going to be like, I'm not going near the theater. Parking no. is going to be a bitch. And right, that's what happened. No, I, I was thinking the opposite. I was thinking that maybe because everyone's going to see Spider-Man, ever like the only the only other option will be West Side Story, or you wind up with some Spider-Man overflow being like, all right, I'll check out West Side Story. West Side Story, even though the opening weekend didn't hit predictions and also hopes. It seems like the type of movie to me that will have legs, especially through the holiday season. So I don't know. I think it's got a chance to at, at least, you know, not necessarily rise to an extreme amount, but keep that steady. And over time that builds up. Well, I, first of all, I agree with you a hundred percent on all of those counts. And I really hope that it finds its legs and turns into like, a greatest showman, sure. which opened with like 9 million on its first week and everybody was writing it off, but then it held on really strong through the holidays it's and wound up making 150 mil. You don't think that's going to happen, Jeff? No, because the songs are older than dirt. Okay. That's why that greatest showman lasted because it had songs that could play on the radio that were sung by Zendaya and Zac Efron and young people. I mean, I just, yeah, I don't know. Well, actually that's a really good point uh, because here's, here's the thing. So, just as an example, I posted on Twitter how how West Side Story uh, did really not well and you know, what happened. And what I found based on the reactions was older, you know, older people were saying, like, why do a remake? No one asked for this remake. And younger people were saying uh, uh, and, and older people were also saying uh, that it was um uh, you know, they're not going to the movies during a pandemic. They're still worried about the pandemic. Of yeah. course, I mean, they should be. But, you know, other people were saying that, you know, they, they younger people were saying that they had a problem with Ansel Elgort because of the scandal surrounding him. So, no, nobody in the real world cares. Nobody oh, in the real world cares. Uh, I beg to differ. You're, you're wrong. Uh, if, if I were to ask any of my 10 high school friends right now, if they've even heard about that, they would say no. But younger, younger moviegoers who live on Twitter, they know about it. Twitter is they are the ones talking 1 about percent of the population. I'm telling you, no one cares. Nobody cares. Nobody Very. cares about the Ansel Elgort allegations. Mm -hmm. I I think I do think a lot of people care. I think a lot of people who should care more don't care and that's why we're seeing him part of the promotional campaign which i i think is is a, a major mistake and a problem for a number of reasons and i actually think the movie would have had a better chance to do well box office wise and in the award season race if they just kept him out of that well i will say this about west side story first of all i saw the movie twice you know the new version i did love the film especially i loved it even more the second time but after watching it twice now, from a critical standpoint, Jeff, I agree with you that Ansel Elgort and Rachel Ziegler don't really have strong chemistry. And, and, and even though Ansel Elgort gets better as the movie goes along, and, and he was quite good in the film, he was good enough, he's just not performance-wise on the level of his female co-stars, especially Rachel Ziegler and especially Ariana DeBose, who is phenomenal. I could not get enough of Ariana DeBose in this movie, but I do think that West Side Story will resonate. It will get nominated for picture and director. Yes. We'll get into director. All right, uh, Jeff, what else is on your list? Uh, Coda. 
I've got yes. Coda at seven. Coda is getting in. For months I've been reading, oh, Coda's so, it's too small to get in. Look at all these big awards movies. Let me tell you something, okay? You show this movie <laughs> to a real person, and they love it. Everyone I've recommended Coda to has said, oh, my God, I had to wipe tears away from my eyes. And that is how Academy members are going to respond, and it is going to be nominated. And I'm telling you, it's not out of the, the, the fight to win. I agree with you. But, Perry, what did you think? of Where does it land on your list, Perry? Coda, Coda is my number six. When we first started Gold Derby for the season, I had it in there. And I thought it was like one of those movies that I was just like going to be stubborn about until I absolutely had no choice but to take it out. And the opposite has happened. And it makes me so happy. Good word of mouth for an excellent movie that deserves to be seen by the most amount of people and get all the recognition that now it feels like it has a real chance to get. And, you know, I know we're just doing nominations now, but when I try to think about, you know, ranking them for the most likely to win, it feels like it could really go to anyone at this point, like anything can happen in this narrative that could tip the scale. So if Coda continues to pick up steam, I don't think it's completely out of the realm of possibility that Coda could be our best picture winner. Uh, I'm so happy to hear you say that because like I said before, uh, this there is a movie that is my number one that I have, I'm really, it is the only movie that I'm really absolutely championing. It is Coda. Coda is my number one uh, it is absolutely like the film that I love the most, that I'm really championing, pushing the most, nominated for four Critics' Choice nominations, including Best Picture. It is the winner of four awards at the Sundance Film Festival almost a year ago, including the Audience Award and the Grand Jury Prize. And it was acquired for a record Sundance acquisition of $25 million. And, you know, Perry, I know we talked about this. Can you imagine seeing Coda at the Eccles on opening night? Can you imagine what that would have been like? I know. Heartbroken. <laughs> it's it's not really a heartbreaking thing, though, because I, I had such, like, a wonderful experience watching it, even though I had to sit in my home and watch it on yeah. a TV. Like, that movie is powerful no matter where and how you watch it, with who you're with. Like, it doesn't matter. So... While I while I would have liked to have had that experience, the experience I had was just as fulfilling, and I appreciate that's that. true. I, you know what? That's a really good point. Watching that, you know, was before was before like you know the vaccine rollout started happening, and, and things were still really really bleak. And here's this movie, feel good crowd pleaser in every sense of the word. And I I look at Coda as the Little Miss Sunshine of 2021. It is just such a wonderful movie it brings all the feels and towards the end of that film i mean i know it's been out for you know been seen for a year now i don't want to spoil it but it really does bring all the feels and stick the landing with an emotionally resonant and powerful ending amelia jones phenomenal star making performance in this movie uh, i just love coda to pieces and more than any other film on this list that we've talked about or will talk about, this is the one that I am rooting for the most. Now, here's the question for both of you. Do you think that Apple has done enough to promote this movie so that – because I feel like not enough people have, have talked about it yet. I think it's nearly impossible at this point when it comes to the public. It's like my view is restricted to the industry invites I get. And if I am just looking at that, I think they have done a lot. I, I feel like I've gotten the most invites to, to Q&As and screenings of CODA than, I mean, almost anything on this list. It's They're really doing a good job. And I think that... Uh, you know, all the stars of the movie have really gone out of their way to to go out and promote the movie. And and also on Twitter, I I see a lot of, of sharing and enthusiasm on Twitter. Right. I really do think that they're putting the legwork in to make this happen. Well, that sounds great. Jeff, what do you think? I think that Troy Kotzer's supporting actor uh, status, he's been picking up a lot of nominations. That's what's keeping the movie in the public eye even more than, you know, whatever Apple's strategy is. I do find Apple's strategy to be a little... Lacking, I think that you're starting to see emphasis being swung on to its other movies like uh, Tragedy of Macbeth. Um, so hopefully they recognize that Coda is the one to, to hang in there with. I think it's it's tricky without any major stars. This yeah, is I, 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 major look, stars. Uh, uh, Troy Kotzer did get nominated for a Golden Globe and Critics' Choice for Supporting Actor. But 
Uh, Amelia Jones, she was for the Critics' Choice. She was nominated for Best Actor Actress under twenty one, and I'm like, what? What are you kidding? She deserves to be nominated for Best Actress. Period. <laughs> and she was not included in that list, and I, I feel like she definitely should have been. All right, where do you guys have Belfast on your list, Perry? Uh oh, I got I got feelings about this one. First off, let me say that I think Belfast is a solid movie. I think it is probably the most overhyped movie on this list. Okay. And in award season in general, I have it at number four right now because I think that the nomination is inevitable. And, you know, I won't be mad about it if it gets a nomination, but in talking about the ones that we're most enthusiastic about, I don't know, after all that hype, I went in and saw Belfast and it was good, but like, it didn't, like, it didn't spark anything in yeah. me or not, not as strongly as some of these other ones. It's like, I look at, at Coda, I'm spoiling one now, but Tick, Tick, Boom, and King Richard, like when I think about the things that I am most enthusiastic about that I will be rooting for that <laughs> night, I'm looking at this list and I feel like I'm down to those three. Uh, I, I love Tick, Tick, Boom. And I agree with you about Belfast. I, I saw it at Telluride. I loved, I, I really, really liked the film uh, and was a little, I'm not, not surprised, but when everyone, but it won the, the award for the People's Choice Award at Toronto and nine of the last winners of the at, of the People's Choice Award in Toronto went on to be nominated for Best Picture at the Academy Awards, and three of those movies won Best Picture, including Nomadland, Green Book, and Twelve Years a Slave. Belfast is nominated for seven Golden Globes, including Best Picture Drama. Nominated for eleven Critics' Choice nominations, including Best Picture. Total box office a whopping six point five million dollars. But we already talked about box office here. I have it at number three on my list, just because I'm. I'm sort of reading the room and and seeing that that it is a beloved film, and I liked it very very much. Uh, I think it does deserve to be nominated. Jeff, what do you think of Belfast? Is it on your list? I thought it was aggressively fine. I put it at number four as well, same as Perry. I, okay. I do think it will be nominated. Okay, so uh, right now, uh, all the movies we talked about are my top six movies. So what is uh, what belongs? What I, goes I, next, Perry? I've got Tick Tick Boom next. That's tick, that's tick, my boom. number seven. That's that's one of those ones where I think as we go through the season and as things lose steam, especially when they are actually released and are not as well received, I think it's going to make room for things like Tick Tick Boom that were re really well received and also available on Netflix. And it's just in good position for that word of mouth to continue to spread. So while I do think it is very much on the bubble, it could go one way or the other. Yeah. My enthusiasm for the movie is is making me push it to the right side and okay. get in there. Jeff, what do you say? Where are you on Tick Tick Boom? Is it on I your have list? Number eight. Uh, the movie in the top five that, that I had that we have not discussed yet is Licorice Pizza, um, which I have not seen yet, and I have to wait till Christmas Day to see it. But I do think that that is a a one of the uh, top contenders. And then the other movie that we ha haven't really mentioned yet um, is Lost Daughter, which I, I can see gaining steam and momentum uh, at this point in the season. Okay, so so I actually have because of what you just said, Perry, about Tick Tick Boom being on the bubble, I have it as an as an honorable mention uh, mm. outside of my top ten. Not because I didn't love it, <laughs> I, I do love it, but I just think that there's going to be more of a more of a push for for Andrew Garfield as best actor, which he is crushes it we run down our top tens then it's a yeah, tick to boom is yeah. not in my top 10 but if it is in your top 10 then then i'll happily put it in my top 10 well, let's, let's each run it. down our, our tens and then come to a consensus and then wait, 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 just to bring up licorice pizza because that that made a pretty drastic leap on my list i had it close to the top of my list for a long while now and, i have it at number eight and okay. i do i do think that it might run the risk of falling off the list because of the the divisive response to it. You guys are putting way too much stock in in Twitter controversies that do not, not match just, the average it's person. Not just Twitter. I'm not though. trying to minimize the Ansel El Elgort allegations. Like they, they mean something to me, but I'm telling you, to the average person, they don't. And the same goes for this nonsense licorice pizza twenty like age gap. Wait, wait, wait. What's the controversy with licorice pizza? The age, what am I missing? The, well, the the age difference, and and there's there's other issues that people have pointed out that where you know the Asian I, joke. 
I absolutely, I loved the movie. I found it very, very effective. I thought the two of them were great. And I, I really did see the value of, you know, watching, watching two people at a particular point in their lives who, who have like a hole in their heart and they try to find, they try to fill that hole in all these different ways, but realize they really need each other. Like there was something about that that was very powerful to me. But when I hear the criticisms about the movie, th those are very fair criticisms to me that I understand. And I think that those criticisms could could ultimately sink it in the long run. I have Licorice Pizza at number nine, uh, eight Critics' Choice nominations, including Best Picture. I, I love the film mostly because of the feel of the movie. It just absolutely feels like a early seventies movie. Not not like a. It, it does not feel staged. It feels like it was shot mm -hmm. and filmed in the early 1970s and I, even more so than, you know, Boogie Nights. Uh, I, I, I did love the film. I have it at number nine. Um, uh, where do you feel, where are you guys on, on two films or three movies? Uh, Don't Look Up, Being the Ricardos and Nightmare Alley. Perry. I've got a lot of feelings about two of them. Being in the Ricardos is actually one of my favorite movies of the year. And I'm okay. very, it was one of those ones where I walked out just like, whoa, this was great. And then I was genuinely surprised when the response wasn't as strong as my personal response. So I'd like to see it get a nomination. I think it's deserving, but I think the the critical response coming out of the first screenings, it it's just turning it in the other direction. I don't think it's going to happen. Nightmare Alley, you both know that I am the biggest Guillermo del Toro fan. Yes. I will root for him all day long. But? I cannot root for Nightmare Alley to get, I was about to say a single nomination. That's not true because I do think it deserves some technical nominations. But that is not a Best Picture nominee. It's I agree. It's just not. This is a surprising take. I was not expecting this from you, P. I'll, I'll, as much as I am a fan of certain individuals, I'll never be anything but honest. And the, the truth of the matter is, I, I think that Nightmare Alley has some great elements, but it, it felt very hollow and slow to me. It, it I'm didn't work. And I, and I, I have no idea what I'm going to make of this movie. I really have, I can't get a baseline on it. I'd like to know what you think after. Well, I, I'm going to listen. Para, I, I get it at I, number 10, by the way, Scott. I have Nightmare Alley number 10 on my list, no. not because I loved it, but because I, you know, I mean, Guillermo did win Best Picture and Best Director a few years ago, 2017, for The Shape of Water. But Perry, I agree with you. I feel like the movie was too long. Uh, the look of the film was great. The production design, cinematography, uh, wardrobe, hair, makeup, all that stuff. But the movie did not – it just didn't hit me. Uh, I did not feel vested. Uh, I, the, the story did not grab me. And uh, I got a little fidgety, like, like what is this movie even about? Uh, something was missing for sure in Nightmare Alley, and I and I really like Bradley Cooper a lot. I feel like he was a little miscast here, so I have it on my number ten. But I'm I'm willing to uh, take out Nightmare Alley and put in Tick Tick Boom. Yes, Jeff, that needs to happen. Well, I, think, I think Tick Tick Boom is in. So all right, all right. So I'm going to do that. Yeah. I'm going to put Tick Tick Boom on the list, and I have being the Ricardos at number eight. But Perry, you don't think that'll get nominated? Oh. I don't think it's going to get nominated. I mean, I would let again, I would like it to, and I hope that's the case. Um, my number nine is Lost Daughter. That's that's one of those ones that I think is, you know, especially with um, getting all these nominations and wins from other organizations and other events. I, I think that's one that's going to continue to to spread word, word of mouth wise, especially as a Netflix movie. And I think Netflix just has like a whole bunch of real strong campaigns going. They are one of the loudest of the bunch right now. And I think that's going to benefit a movie like Lost Daughter. And then my number 10 is me being stubborn. Like it's a, it's a wasted vote here. It's not right. going to happen, but I don't care. What is mass. it? It's mass. Ma oh, mass. No, mass is, mass is great. Uh, I, th I see Ann Dowd possibly getting nominated for best actress, but if if Mass does not get a single Academy Award nomination, I will be absolutely crushed. Agreed. Crushed. 
Mass is amazing. Mass is so, so powerful. Such a masterclass in acting and definitely in writing as well. Uh, and directing. I mean, yeah. just, like we don't need flashy visuals. Like, not, I don't want to name names now to devalue what some flashy visuals can achieve. But sometimes a director's very light hand on the camera is a sign of great direction that completely changes how effective a movie is. And I think that's the case with Fran Kranz and Mass. All right, Jeff, where do you sit? Where do you feel first on, on being the Ricardos? And if you had a chance to see Mass yet? Uh, yeah, I saw Mass at Sundance. I, I thought the performances were good, but what wasn't for me. Don't think it's going to be for, for general audiences or awards voters. Um, being the Ricardos, I thought was a TV movie about a TV show. Uh, I thought it was okay. Uh, the, you know, Javier and, and Nicole Kidman were both really good, but I don't see that getting in. I, I really like being the Ricardos. I mean, you know, uh, Lucille Ball is such an icon, but no one's ever made a, like, a real full movie about her. Uh, and people love movies about the business, which this very much is. And it's uh, it's relevant with the, the 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 sexism that went on back then and, and how Lucy was like a trailblazer and, and you know, running a studio, Desilu, you know, female studio head. I think that it could get in, but if you, if both of you don't think it will, then I'll keep it off the list. And the last question I have for you is what about don't look up? No. <laughs> I don't, see, I don't, I don't know. I don't know with the, with the packaging of that one. I think that even the divisive response could get it that le it like it's possible. I don't have it on my list right now, but mm -hmm. that's one that I could see popping up simply because who's associated with it. And right. you know, I, I am one of the people that reviewed it very positively. I think it's a very effective satire. I, I liked it a lot. I actually have it at number seven on my list. Uh, I had six Critics' Choice nominations, including Best Picture. And I, I agree with you. The fact that uh, um, uh, Adam McKay, who has uh, been nominated for four, or for actually for five Academy Awards, and he's an Oscar winner, for for one of them which is an adapted screenplay for the big short so the academy does like him a lot and because of the star power with this movie the message of the film the satire of it i think it gets in so i actually have that as number seven on my list but we got to jump into best director so the the best picture nominations that we are going with are coda west side story belfast king richard dune power of the dog licorice pizza Tick, tick, boom, and the lost wait, daughter. Lost daughter. All right, that's nine. That's nine. Then up. Then then number ten is don't look up. There's our ten. Mm, I yeah, can, I could get behind that for now. Okay. Okay. Now, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, as you know, we are going to come back to our best picture picks uh, nominations. So this is not the end all be all of our list. We're just getting started. Last question, really quick. Does Macbeth stand a chance? possibly Perry. At the, at the beginning of the season i thought that movie was going to clean up and now it's like the conversation has gone silent i don't like what like has happened i guess um I haven't seen it, so. okay i was just curious okay let's move on to director i think uh, uh four of the directors on on my list are 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 i think absolute slam dunks uh but perry who's your first slam dunk on best director i mean guess it's jane campion for power of the dog i yep. like i think she is a, an absolute 100 percent guarantee for a nomination and i also think she's the clear front runner at this point wow front runner okay jeff yeah. where's jane campion on your list number one number one okay i have her at number four uh, she's already an Oscar winner for original screenplay for the piano, and she was nominated for best director for the piano. Uh, but yes, uh, that she's absolutely a shoe in for a nomination for sure. Jeff, who else is on your list for best director? Denis, number two. Yep, Denis is awesome. Perry, Denis is my number three. I think he's yeah. getting the nomination. Denis is my number three. Of course, Oscar nominee as well for Arrival. Absolutely, positively, he gets in. Uh, Perry, who else you got? Can I guess your number two, Mans? Who's my sure. number two? Kenneth sure. Branagh for uh, Belfast. Uh, Kenneth Branagh is my number one, actually. Oh, uh, okay. Five time Academy. Oh, that's fair. I should have guessed when uh, when Jane wasn't number one, but uh, yeah. Belfast is my number two here. Okay, Je uh, Jeff. My, my three. So I do think okay. that those are the top three contenders. Uh, top th top three for sure. And then of course, uh, I'm, I'm assuming both of you have Spielberg on your best director list. Yeah. Okay. 
He's my number yeah. two, Perry. He's my number four. Okay, four. this would be uh, if he won Best Director, this would be his third Oscar win as Best Director after Schindler's List and Saving Private Ryan. I think he is absolutely a contender, a front runner. Uh, next to Jane Campion, and uh, it's Spielberg's best movie. I, I, I'm saying that West Side Story is Spielberg's. <laughs> not only is it a return to form for Spielberg, it's his best film since Munich uh, from 2005, which is a movie I just love to pieces. So our four picks are our absolute uh, uh, slam dunks. Who is number five, Perry? Right now, I'm curious to see how the conversation goes the next two two months or so. Paul Thomas Anderson, Licorice Pizza. Yep, yep. He's my number five, too. Uh, Eight-time Academy Award nominee. Two of those nominations for Best Director for Phantom Thread and There Will Be Blood. Jeff, is is PTA on your list? Yes, he is. I'm contending with a little vacuuming there. But, uh, yes, PTA is number five on my list. Wow. Uh, I think that the five are fairly clear cut. <laughs> Can you hear anything? No, you're all good. Okay. Sorry. Wow. Uh, no. The, the, the person that I would say to watch out for, though, and I, I hope I'm not butchering her name, whether it's Sean Hader or Sean Hader. Sean. Sean Hader. Oh. Okay. Well, I'll tell, you the, I'll tell you what. She had the toughest challenge out of anybody. I'm not saying that Coda looks visually like Power of the Dog or Dune or West Side Story because it doesn't. But she, she had to overcome certain obstacles in communicating with her cast. And that is half the job of a director. It's not just the visual presentation. It's how do you direct your actors? And I think that that could really catapult her into contention this year. Perry. I would, I would really not mind if that turned out to be <laughs> one of the big surprises of the season. I, I'm very into that idea, and I'm, I'm kind of hoping that happens now. I would be over the moon if Sean Heater gets nominated for Best Director. Uh, who does she knock out here, though, is the question. I would say that she would have to knock out PTA, uh, which is possible. Um, I, I, I mean, certainly coda has been around for a year, so people have seen it, whether they did it in theaters or certainly on Apple TV+. Plus. And if you have not seen, by the way, if you've not seen Coda, watch it because you are missing out if you have not seen it. So so, but no, I, I agree, Jeff. I would love to see that happen. But what about like Adam McKay, Guillermo del Toro, or even Ronaldo Marcus Green, who directed King Richard? I've been thinking about King Richard. Yeah. I like when you when you look at this list of people, it it's it's like a list of directors that I think almost anyone out there would know in a heartbeat the second you said their names. And I think maybe that kind of you know, easily recognizable industry icon is what could wind up defining this category. But that that is another one that I think has a good chance of maybe being one of the surprises of the season. Uh, Jeff? Uh, yeah, I, I, I certainly think Ronaldo is, is in contention. He uh, is definitely an up-and-coming filmmaker. Um, I don't know if... if if it's going to be enough to, to, you know, leap over Paul Thomas Anderson or Steven Spielberg. Uh, I think that if anyone has a chance, because the directors, it always gets a little funky, right? It's That's always like the weirdest, I, I think, category. Uh, keep an eye on Joe Wright for Serrano. Keep an eye on Pedro Almodovar, um, even Joel Cohen. So I, I don't think that that's, that category is necessarily written in stone, even though it does have five clear front runners, so to speak. Well, I, I would say it has absolutely no question four absolute set in stone front runners with Kenneth Branagh, Steven Spielberg, Denis Villeneuve, and Jane Campion. The question is that number five, could it be PTA? I know that's what we're going with. Could it be Sean Heater? That would be awesome. Renell to Marcus Green. I mean, the movie King Richard, I mean, maybe it's like too polished and isn't like daring or gritty enough to warrant a best picture nomination or a best director nomination, but the movie did not direct itself if it's going to get nominated for best picture and, and the people who love it really, really love it. Uh, but, uh, uh, listen, this is another category that, of course, we are going to revisit before the Academy Award nominations are announced. And the Academy Awards themselves take place on March 27th. So the Academy Awards, ladies and gentlemen, are still three months away. So what that means for, for the three of us and what that means for all of you is a lot more episodes to come of FYC because, ladies and gentlemen, we are Back in business 
with FYC. So make sure you follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Movie Mance. Make sure you comment below. Let us know what you think of our nominations. Are we right on? Who are we missing? How happy are you to have FYC back? Perry, where can people follow you? Right here on this YouTube channel. And <laughs> yeah. Instagram at PNumberoff. Go watch Collider Ladies Night. Thank you. Uh, Jeff? He's Jeff, muted. He's audio. muted when he could plug himself. Guys, I'm still, I'm, I was so close. I was so <laughs> close to making it through without any tech difficulties. I'm uh, at the Insnider and Insnider Plus on Twitter. And hopefully we'll have some exciting job uh, news to share soon. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us on FYC. And until the next episode, FYC. See you later. later.